right, well, hey, I am so glad that you are here this morning. It's going to be an awesome morning. And uh, before I dive into the message, I, I just wanted to say something. Um, I wanted to say thank you guys for all that you have done. Uh, it's so exciting to think of just being a year into this. And I also want to just ask you uh, to be patient. There's a lot of different ideas and thoughts and ministries that we have and we want to do and start up and so many different things are swirling through our heads and we have some proposals out with the church we're renting right now and so we're kind of just waiting to hear back of how things play out and then once we hear back we can uh, move forward with the strategy of what God gives us and all that. So I just want to encourage you, be patient. How many of you know that's not my, my strength right there, patience? And so maybe it's not your strength either, so just encourage you to be patient though. Uh, we're continuing our series today that we are calling Dear Church. And this series actually came to me after one of our intercessory prayer nights. We were up here and we were praying. It was two and a half hours. Everyone kind of left around nine o'clock and I stuck around for another hour and I prayed and I felt like God just dropped this series on my heart, a now series. This is what God is speaking. And so the idea is, dear church or dear connection point, if God was writing a letter, an email, a text message, here's some things I believe that he would say to us. Last week we talked about unity. I believe God would say, hey, dear connection point, I want you to be united. I want you to be strong. I want the foundation to be strong. Now, God always wants us united. The devil always wants us divided. But I believe God is calling us into a season of unity, meaning that, that, that we're focused and we're locked in of being unified. And we looked at a tree. Sometimes a tree that grows really fast is also known for weak and brittle uh, roots. It, it would. It's, it's known for just being weak. And under certain storms and conditions, it can't withstand and so i believe god is calling us to be a church no matter what storms what conditions come our way we stand strong so calling us to unity this week uh, we're going to look at the word humility i believe god would say hey dear connection point i want you to be humble i want you to clothe yourselves with humility and do everything that you can to keep it in colossians chapter 3 verses 12 it says this it says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. To clothe yourselves with humility. So it's the first Sunday of October. The weather is pretty nice outside right now, but how many of you know fall is, you know, the leaves are changing the weather's getting a little bit cooler, and in a few months from now, for some of us, it will be that dreaded winter. No matter how much we want to forget about it, it will be here. And when you leave your house, what do you do? You throw on your winter clothes. You throw on your winter coat. You are prepared for the elements that you are walking out into. When the Bible says to clothe yourselves with humility, I wanted to use that illustration of throwing on your winter coat because I want you to think of you that when you walk out that you are putting on, you are clothing yourselves with humility. But when we talk about humility, we've got to understand what, what it is biblically. Because a lot of times we think of humility and we have the, the mindset that it means no confidence, insecure, and so I want to look at what does humility really mean biblically. Humility is meekness, lowliness, and an absence of self. Lowliness and an absence of self. Pride is often described as going high, while humility is often described as going low. Pride is inflating myself with air to be puffed up, to look like I'm big and important, while humility is an absence of self or deflating myself so that there's less of me. Pride is full of air, uh, substance, uh, you know, humility is full of substance, even though it's, it, it appears less. It's low, it's, it's an absence of self. Pride would be puffed up. Um, but I, I think it's important to understand because when we talk about humility, it's more than just posture. It has a lot to do with the attitude of the heart. Because often you can think of someone who is being humble because they give the appearance of being humble, but really they're going high. 
Well, well, what do you mean by that? Well, there are times where you look at someone and they just, they like, they go high. You know what I'm saying? They inflate themselves. You're like, that's pride. You know, like you look at yourself and you're like, oh, that's pride. But sometimes there's the appearance of going low. So let, let me give you an illustration. Maybe you're involved in a text messaging thread with your family, your friends, and then all of a sudden someone says something like this. Well, hey, my son is doing fundraising for, you know, the school and nobody ever helps us out. And can you help us out? You know, I'm reaching out to my family and woe is me. And I, and I just want to make sure everyone like, no, you know, and it's like it gives the appearance of going low. But really, it's making the whole conversation now about them. And making everyone else feel a little uncomfortable and awkward, it's like, oh, wow, nobody, you know, but that's what pride secretly does. Because it's not about, am I helping anyone else out? I've just made the whole conversation about me. I've lifted myself up, even though I'm giving the appearance that I'm going low. So why are we talking about this? Well, I believe this is something God is calling us to, that if we go low, God will exalt us. If we go low, God will lift us up in his timing. First Peter 5 6 says humble yourselves therefore under god's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time james 4 chapter 10 says humble yourselves before the lord and he will lift you up that our job is to humble ourselves and god will exalt or lift up in due time so if you haven't been exalted if you haven't been lifted up if the prayer hasn't been answered of what you've been praying for then it might not be god's timing in fact instead of seeking or searching or praying for that promotion or that raise another idea or concept would be to pray for being a person that would deserve the raise pray to be a person that has the character and integrity to handle the promotion not even focusing where you want it like but who you are See, our job is not to exalt ourselves. Our job is to humble ourselves. Sometimes, though, I don't know about you, we get this backwards. I get this backwards. I, I view it as sometimes in life, you got to climb up the ladder, you know, and that's just what the world teaches us. Climb up the ladder of success. Get up to the top in your, your business, your profession, your life. You know, climb the ladder. And what God is saying is actually just humble yourselves and he'll lift you up. You know, I think if God was talking to you and me and writing us a letter, he would say, hey, connection point, clothe yourselves with humility, be humble, and I will exalt you as a church to be a beacon of hope and strength, to be a place of healing, but I will be the one that exalts or lifts up. And sometimes I get it backwards, we get it backwards, um, because when we try to exalt ourselves, God actually opposes that. First Peter 5.5 5 says this, in the same way you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. It doesn't make sense sometimes because I want to climb up the ladder and then God says, well, I oppose that. <laughs> Humble yourselves, I'll lift you up, I'll show favor, but those who exalt themselves, I oppose. Now, when we're talking about humility and we're talking about pride, uh, let, let me help you understand. I'm not talking about, say, as a parent, you're proud of your son. Your, your son worked really hard and got a grade and you're, you know, good grade and you're proud of them. Your wife or your husband went back to college and got their degree. You're proud of them. When we're talking about pride and the sin of pride, it's excessively self-focused and self-elevating. That is why pride is a sin. Because at the core of pride, pride is really self-worship. I'm worshiping myself. I'm exalting myself. I'm going to lift myself up. Charles Spurgeon says this. He describes pride as an all-pervading sin, and that pride is so natural to fallen man that it springs up in his heart like weeds in a well-watered garden. Meaning, hey, you could have an incredible well-watered garden in your heart and be careful, because pride could just take over. Be careful because it's, it's common to you and me. Like, th this is something that nobody's ever going to be able to, like, fully conquer. We're always going to have to deal with the weeds of pride rooting itself and pulling itself up in our hearts. And he says this, it's ever touches evil. You may hunt down this fox and think you've destroyed it. And lo, your very exaltation is pride. 
None have more pride than those who dream they have none. Pride is a sin with a thousand lives. It seems impossible to kill. That we're all going to have to wrestle through the self-worship and self-exaltation to lift up. So let me, let me throw out kind of how it works for me, okay? We have our one-year celebration two, two Sundays ago. And someone will come up to me and be like, that was an amazing message. You, that, you're a gifted communicator. And, and something really nice and kind like that. Uh, I appreciate that because I don't always get kind things, just so you know. Most of the non-kind things are done in an email, but it, it, it is what it is, you know. And if I'm not careful, that seed of pride can be planted in my heart. And I'm just, like, I just consider myself a normal dude. Well, I don't know if I'd consider normal but when I, when I say, like, normal, I mean, like, I'm not, like, over the top. Like, when someone says something really nice to me, I, I don't respond like this. Oh, blessing and glory to uh, hallowed be his name. I'm so thankful he's given me the opportunity to breathe air and I could speak out to people. And it's only because of God, the glory, honor, and power to him. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I don't do that. <laughs> I just say this. Ready? Thank you. That's it. Just simple. Thank you. Everything I said before was true. But I just say thank you. But if I'm not careful, that seed can be planted where I, I am a gifted communicator. I am talented. And I have to remind myself. See, sometimes when you get compliments, the seed of pride can, you got to remind yourself, okay, I, I like some, how someone else worded it once. They're like, don't let the compliments go to your head. And then don't let the negative things where people are like, this church is not even a church. You're horrible at what you, you know, that kind of stuff. Don't let it affect you either. Just kind of find the middle ground there. Like, I'm not as good as they say I am, and I'm not as bad as they say I am, kind of thing. So, I want to look at two stories in the Bible to kind of help us with what we're talking about today. The first one is Joseph. Uh, we're going to look at jo Joseph. We're just looking at a couple verses. Joseph, uh, Genesis 37, 5 through 10. But I want to give us a little bit of an understanding. So Joseph, there's many things in his life. Long, we don't have time to go through it all. But Joseph eventually became the number two person and oversaw food. There was a severe famine in the land. And they, he was seven years of saving up and then seven years where he oversaw, you know, being able to give to people that were in need. So let's go when he was younger. Let's start with verse five. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. So they already hated him, and now they hate him more because of this dream. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Let's just stop right there. If you're the younger brother and you go brag to your older brothers that in this dream that you had where they're going to think that they're going to come and bow down to you, that doesn't seem like the smartest move as the younger brother. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? I just want to throw out a thought that I've never thought of till about a month ago. And I heard someone else speaking and then I've chewed on that and prayed through it. Um, but I am a big believer that our calling and our destiny isn't just one thing. It's a journey of us going through life. And one of the big callings of Joseph's life was to be in a position to save a lot of people by distributing food. One of those groups were his family. Yet, when you read this story, it, it's these, these things, you know, they're coming to bow down to him, and he goes and brags about it to his brothers. And I've never had this thought before until now, so let me throw it out to you. What if the dream God gave to him wasn't really the calling that God had, but to reveal pride in Joseph's own heart, to go brag to his brothers that you're going to come and bow down to me. Then got him into this pit. They sold him into slavery. And a long journey that he went through to work on his character and his integrity. To be in a spot where now he can really live out the calling. 
I just think that's so good. Because I was thinking about as young preachers, they might have a time with God where they feel called to preach. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to stand up in front of tons of people. And they don't even realize the own pride in their heart because they're making it all about them. This whole thing was about him. They're going to come bow down to me. Look at me. And then it got to a spot where I'm going to feed people. So we, oh, oh, it's going to be about me. I'm going to preach to thousands. So I don't really care. I just want to feed as many people as possible. Pride to humility. I want to look at another story. It's uh, Numbers chapter 12. It's the story on uh, Aaron, Miriam, and Moses. If you don't know this story, uh, uh, basically Moses, uh, you know, God, God leading Moses. Aaron and Miriam kind of challenged Moses a little bit. Uh, verse 2, they say this. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? But the Lord heard him. Like, what, what they're saying here is this. Well, God only speaks to Moses? Can't God speak to me too? And, and so they kind of challenges Moses' leadership. And th this part kind of scared me. It said, but the Lord heard them. I started thinking, God, have I said any careless words that I don't think anyone else has heard? Or maybe they've heard, but I don't think this person has heard. Or, but you have heard? <laughs> like, God heard them. So God had a little meeting with them. And then verse 7 says this. But not with my servant Moses. Of all of my house, he is the one I trust. What God is saying there is this. I speak to everyone, but he is the one I put into that position. So he is the one that I trust. I speak to him face to face, clearly. And not in riddles. He sees the Lord and he is. So why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? He said, you are so careless with your words to criticize who I put in charge. You were so careless. And then the Lord was very angry with them and he departed. So why do I even bring all this up? Well, we're talking about humility. Because see, their complaint was who Moses was marrying. The ethnicity. But that wasn't really the issue. That was the words that they were saying. You ever, you ever say things, but that's not really the heart behind what you're saying? There's underlining things. Here was the underlining issue, jealousy and pride. Miriam, the instigator, felt like she was going to lose some spiritual clout and went against who God put in charge. And that's why she is the one that got sick. Why do I bring that up? Because God is calling us into humility and if we clothe ourselves in humility people will be drawn to this place uh, because of jesus and our love and servanthood to get them there not to exalt ourselves and try to make it about jealousy and pride it was this group of people their grumbling and their lack of faith that the first generation of israelites to leave captivity was not allowed to enter the promised land. So let me give you some action steps. And there's no way I'm going to get through all these action steps. So I'll do the best I can. First one is this. Honor. Show honor. If we look at the same verse that we were looking at, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Uh, if you look at the beginning, it says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So I was at another church one time and I visited this church. It's one I like. I've said this story before, but it fits so perfectly here. And I was visiting and the executive pastor would always get up and he would talk about what an honor and a privilege it is to serve under this house. And he would talk great things about the pastor there. And uh, finally, I, like one time I was there and I was just like, oh. What a suck up, you know, like, I was like, holy cow, what a suck up. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me. <laughs> He's not sucking up. You don't have a culture of honor in your own heart. Honor is to show deep value, esteem, and respect towards someone. He's not sucking up. He's honoring who God put there, overseeing him. And I was like, oh God, forgive me. I was a part of a prayer time, um, and Justin, if you want to come up and play on the, I know people love when I, I say it this way, right? The guitar, you know? It's a part of a prayer time. We were praying for each other, and I kind of, I was like, oh, it's my turn. I'll pray. And uh, it was like, no, we're going to pray for you last. And I was like, well, I don't have to be prayed for last. I don't really care. 
And, and I just felt like the Lord was just saying, uh, they're just honoring you. In the position that you have, they're just showing honor. So the way that our denomination works is uh, every three years, or no, the first three years of a church plant, uh, we get to go to this conference in Dallas. And uh, they pay for our flight, they pay for our uh, hotel, and they pay for our food. And so, pretty awesome. We went last year, and uh, all expenses covered. And, uh, but we have to pay for luggage, and so we go online to check in and, uh, you know, do our luggage, and uh, pops up is an upgrade. 90 bucks to upgrade to first class. Like, coming back home is like 250 bucks each, but going there, 90 bucks. And I was like, uh, wait, and I know it's $25 to do bags, but first class, you don't have to pay bags, so 90 minus 25, $65. You know, and so then I go to Tara, what do you think about upgrading our flight? Well, I don't really want it. Well, too late. I already did it. You know, like that's kind of what I said. Because <laughs> we find first class there. It's so exciting. Yes. And we go, and then I see all of these people from Minnesota on the same flight. And Tara's like, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to be on first class. And I was like, I don't care. I'll sit there and watch them go back. Hey, have a great flight. Have a great flight. <laughs> Drink my Sprite, you know, like whatever. My warm towel, all that kind of stuff. But one of the people on that flight was our superintendent. The superintendent oversees all of the churches in Minnesota for the assemblies of God. No way I'm flying on that flight in first class Why our superintendent sitting back in coach. So we go and offer our flights to them, our seats. Like, hey, let's change seats. And they're like, oh, you don't have to do that. And I was like, you don't understand. There is no way I'm sitting in first class. Why, someone who God has put over me goes and sits in coach. Absolutely not. That is honoring. If we want to humble ourselves, honor who God has placed over you. Honor your father and your mother. Maybe, maybe you grew up in a situation where biblically your parents have lost the right to be an overseer of you. Okay, I'm not talking about that. But I'm saying sometimes it's just an opinion or a matter of what we want. And to show honor to who God has placed over you. You want to humble yourselves, honor who God has placed over you. You want to bow up in pride, then push them down and exalt yourself. God opposes that heart. He doesn't show favor on that heart. But he shows favor upon those who humble themselves. Trust. James chapter 4, verse 16, uh, 14 and 16 says, Why do you don't even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that as it is. Your boast and your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. You want to humble yourselves, trust God. I don't know about you, but I, I get so stressed out sometimes. I, I don't know what tomorrow, I don't know what a week, I don't know what a month is. And I start trying to come up with my own plans and my own schemes. And we were joking before service because there's some people that you are the, you're, you're the type of person where God's like, hey, get out of your seat. Come on, come on, move. Like, let's go do something. Come on, like, please stop sitting there. Well, that's not my issue. My issue is God saying, hey, I'm back here. Can you come over here and stop doing it your way? Because I got something else planned. But you're like five miles ahead of me. Because I, 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 I struggle with patience. And, and you know, like, it's just like, like, let's go. I got one shot to live. Like, you know, let's just go and go for it. And then God's like, but that's not my timing. And his timing's perfect. So you trust. How do you humble yourselves? You don't exalt your plans, your ideas, your opinions, your will. You humble yourself and trust. Trust what the Bible says and trust what God's word says. Like what his spirit is speaking to you. Third one was value others. To value other people. Fourth one was serve. Matthew 23, 11 through 12 says, The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. To serve. When we're talking about serving. I'm not talking about find a spot on the ministry schedule and serve, although we do want you to do that. I'm talking about an attitude of heart that says, This is not about me. 
It's not about, hey, my brothers are going to come down and bow down to me. It's about, hey, I'm going to go through the process to get to a spot where now I can help a lot of people out. I'm going to serve. Pride is inflating. It's lifting myself up. Humility is a deflation of self. It's, it's, there's less of me and more of God. I'm, I'm going low, and then God lifts me up in his time. Why? Because then I can serve and make it about him. The last thing is repent, which we'll actually look more at next week. And for those of you wondering, uh, if we do communion here, we plan on doing it next week. Um, as it fits into what we're talking about, but repent. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. When God reveals something, you have the choice to humble yourself by repenting. When God shows you a weed, you repent and you take it out. When you don't repent, it starts to consume the well-watered garden. Because now you've opposed yourself against God. I'm going to ask all of you to stand on your feet. Here's a natural tendency we all have. We talk about pride. Well, I could think of this person and 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 this person. person. You could think of this person and this person and it's all. Well, what if God's trying to work on your heart? Because then I'm like, oh gosh, man, I got so much stuff in here, Lord. Come on, work on it. Like, here I am. I repent. God, it's not about someone else. It's about humbling myself and allowing you to speak. Is there anything in my heart that is unholy? Anything in my heart that is prideful? Anything in my heart that that shouldn't be there? God, I, I, I work on me. So I want everyone just to close your eyes and bow your heads. I want to just take a moment. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak. Right now, let there be something that shows up in our mind or our heart that we need to repent of. Maybe we need to forgive so-and-so. Maybe we need to release this relationship. Maybe we need to ask for forgiveness for careless words. Maybe we need to call an old boss, an old pastor, an old church and ask for forgiveness for lack of honoring who was over you. Maybe we need to release the hurt from the the past uh, relationship or past church experience that's hindering us from moving forward because our heart and our mind's still back there. Not what I'm saying, but what is your Holy Spirit saying? God, speak to us. Let something be revealed, spirit realm, in our heart and in our mind. And then let us not let it keep it there. But let us pull that weed out supernaturally and spiritually to the roots and to rip out whatever it is. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.